imagine beautiful poems that never end, books that are written for you specifically as you read them, strangers collaborating to create nuanced stories with thrilling plots. These marvels, along with many other startling manifestations of electronic literature, may revolutionize how we think about reading and writing. Welcome to Augmented Humanity. Our guests are modern explorers working at the intersection of technology and the humanities. They help us to understand ourselves and the worlds we create in this digital age. They are thinkers, creators, makers, and academics working in diverse fields like linguistics, technology, game and object design, and ethics. I'm your host, Craig Goldsmith. I'm your host, Ellen Dornan. On this program, we're joined by Mark Marino and Leonardo Flores, both with the Electronic Literature Organization. Leonardo Flores is chair of the English department at Appalachian State University. Author and critic Mark Marino recently published Critical Code Studies at MIT Press and produces crowdsourced literature with Meanwhile NetProv Studios. Thank you both so much for joining us today. I'm really excited to have you here to talk about your work. And I guess we have to start with what is electronic literature? Is it like digital humanities where nobody can answer the question? Or is there sort of a standard definition? We have answers for sure. I'm Leo Flores, and I'm going to talk a little bit about my minimalist definition. We've been writing on pages, laying ink on paper for thousands of years. We've been developing print technologies for hundreds of years, and we have all kinds of technologies that allow us to do the writing, whether it's on a virtual page, that will result in a, in a printed page. But since the invention of computing, people have been interested in exploring what writing looks like when you are doing things with computers or computer-like devices that are unique to that medium. Electronic literature is literature written in conversation with digital media technologies. That means things like computation, text generation, multimedia integration, interactivity, network data, network collaboration, and things like that. And so more and more people are writing on screens, on touchscreen devices, on digital media, and they're sharing this work that can only really be experienced in screens in many of cases. Well, I think President Flores, president of the Electronic <laughs> Literature Organization, that, that, that was a fantastic definition. This is Mark Marino speaking now. I love Leo's definition. Obviously, I agree wholeheartedly. I'd throw in a couple of dimensions to it. The one thing that we tend to emphasize is this notion of that the works are digitally born. So they could not have been made without this digital dimension. So they can end up in print. A great example, this wonderful work by Aaron Reed called Subcutanean. And this is a book that is print on demand but the versions of it differ depending on which random seed you have. And so lines of the book are different in different editions. Now, people can have the same different edition, but there are different ones that are generated. And again, it's all computational how this is made. So it's a print book, but it couldn't exist without this digital process. It used to be you're sitting next to somebody on the plane. What do you do? Oh, I study and make electronic literature. Oh, hey, look, well, that's good. I have an e-book right here on my e-reader. And you say, well, okay, well, I guess that is an electronic piece of literature in a sense. That's not quite what we're talking about just yet. And probably because there's a little tiny dimension that we don't always make explicit is that often, although not as a prerequisite, there's a sense that the artistry comes in the way that you play with and experiment with the digital form. I hate to self-promote, but in Bunk Magazine, this humor magazine that I co-ran in the late 90s and into the 2000s, we decided to have an issue called the Los Wickelis Timespedia. <laughs> and, and we just imagined that you take the entire LA Times and make it all wiki format and just invite everybody to write whatever they want to write. So we had micro articles. Someone's reporting their child's soccer game. 
We had someone reporting the graffiti that showed up on their fence. Then we would have like Scott Retberg, who is the co-founder of the Electronic Literature Organization, who's in Norway. He wrote as a character named Lars, who would report about things like skiing conditions or this beautiful article, which is, I cannot remember the difference between my Facebook friends and my real friends. But again, some artistic intention in the way that you're using the digital medium is maybe a prerequisite for this genre. What are some other examples of what you think of as electronic literature where that artistic intent is very different than what we would have seen in the previous 5,000 years of narrative literature? The thing is, it's a paradigm shift. So for instance, the idea of characters, right? We've had characters forever. And these characters, when you read about them, all you read is basically a record of what they have done. And then we can think about what their motivations are. We can think about why they did or said what they did. But one of the earliest forms of electronic literature is the chatterbot. In 1964, Joseph Weizenbaum at MIT and team put together this chatbot. And the idea is that people can interact with it. It had these different scripts. The most famous one was called Eliza after the Pygmalion play, right? Eliza Doolittle. And so people would use teletype and interact with this. And the idea was it was trying to pass the Turing test to see if people thought they were having an actual conversation with a person. Part of what was successful about this script in particular is that Eliza was patterned after a Rogerian psychologist. A what psychologist? Rogerian. You know, like Carl Rogers. Yeah, it's a very sort of listening approach and kind of reinforcing what people have said. Definitely reflective. Yeah. Why do you say you have a problem? <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. There it is, exactly. And so the program would draw from the conversation that you would have if you mention your father down the line. It would say, tell me more about your father, right? And it's like... <gasps> She's listening, and people would get all excited. But notice what we're doing here is we're reinventing the character, and the bot is a character. One of the things that people realize is here you have a character that comes to life, that the behaviors are scripted, that has certain motivations. And so as we start developing characters, say for chatbots or say for phone answering machines, or for bots like Alexa and smart speakers and all of these things, or video game NPC kind of non-player character interactions, you have these personalities. You are creating characters. The desire may not always be literary. It has its practical applications, as we have discovered a lot of late, but still, and that is the seed for a tradition that has found a new life in social media networks like Twitter, where there's a number of writers, myself included. Mark, have you made Twitter bots? Oh, I've made too many Twitter bots, <laughs> yes. Uh, I know you've got some great ones, Leo. Probably my most successful one is a bot that generates the synopses of plots of Hallmark holiday movies. Oh yeah, that's a favorite of mine. It is brilliant. You know, again, that was one that came out of a lot of time spent at home with my dear mother, who really loves those films, and realizing that perhaps they followed a little bit of a formula, which could be celebrated in Twitter bot fashion. Here the bot is generating plots in a genre that we're very familiar with. But one of the things that bots do is that they have accounts, they have profiles. Some of them really foreground personality and are interactive. It's just to show you the idea of the paradigm shift that is possible. And we're just talking about character and characterization, which is one of many, many, many aspects of the literary that digital literature or electronic literature explores. So you follow Eliza, you know, on into the future and the next bot generates one of the first computer generated or at least the content for one of the first computer generated novels, The Policeman's Beard. But then take it into the early 2000s and you've got these two wonderful artists, Andrew Stern and Michael Matias, and they make this amazing piece called Facade. So this is a video game you're playing with these 
two dimensional characters, but you kind of move it around it into the three dimensional space of their apartment. And these are your friends from 10 years ago from college. They got married. And you're about to have the worst evening with them that you could imagine. So it's loosely inspired by Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? And uh, Tripp and Grace are about to just have the row of the century. And you are in the middle of it. And you can say one sentence at a time to them. You can type freely whatever you want to say to them. And they basically play you off of each other. And they compete for your attention and your sympathy. Here we have people who are self-consciously drawing from previous literary forms, and then they're using the tools at their disposal. Now, one thing that may be hard to see, the Twitter bots, in how many of them are made, we use some tools for this. There's a platform called Cheap Bots Done Quick that uses the Tracery platform. There's also a wonderful one that's built out of Google Spreadsheets by a fellow named Zach Whalen. But basically, they're pulling words out of bins, and they're putting them into patterns. And that practice is as old as the Dadaists. That practice is as old as the Surrealists. How is what you're talking about, though, different than, like, a role-playing game? Some, sometimes it's not. You know, in the branch of electronic literature, the branch of NetProv, which we think of as uh, networked online collaborative storytelling. This is something that my writing partner, Rob Wittig, and I have been working to develop over the past 10 years or so. A lot of it is setting up collaborative writing games that can happen over digital media. And we don't tend to develop our own platforms. We see ourselves as cuckoo birds who lay our eggs in other birds' nests. But the idea is that that we're building these structured writing games, again, building on the practices of the Ulipo and the Situationists and the Surrealists, but they could be also based on parlor games, traditional parlor games, that can be played over digital platforms. But usually there's, there is a digital dimension that's a little bit uncommon. So I'll give you an example. We did one a few years ago. We want to do something with climate change, but our current generation of young people, Generation Z, is so traumatized by climate change, right? I mean, it really causes them a kind of, sends them into depression in a way that probably it should, but it was awful, right? And so we play these games often with young people, with my students, with his students, and with whoever wants to play out there. So this was co-developed with Samara Haley Steele, who's a wonderful LARP live action role play developer and a climatologist from the University of Washington named Dargan Frierson, who had this wonderful piece of software that could map out the future of weather, however many years into the future, given certain carbon conditions. So taking all this into account, we said, okay, let's find out the weather 50 years from now, and let's have five locations. So we had Florida, Argentina, India, Bangkok, and we said, why don't we let people imagine what it would be like to attend a destination wedding there 50 years in the future? And this piece of software does not just predict the climate 50 years in the future. It predicts the weather on specific days and locations. We had a JavaScript generator that made family relationships. It gave a bunch of roles, just randomly generating these between two families. They were always sort of like Hatfield and McCoys or Capulets and Montagues, whatever. They had some sort of like opposition to each other. And you would pick these rules that were matched with little adjectives that helped you. And then you would write your way through eight beats of the wedding from arriving to the cold feet moment to the day of the wedding, etc. Collectively imagining how this weather information, because you got a weather report along with your welcome packet, was going to impact your experience. It is absolutely collaborative role play. But it's got this like little tiny computational element that we wouldn't have access to. It's sort of what you were saying, Leo, like the weather itself becomes a primary character in this narrative. We said the wedding was the ultimate wedding crasher. You know, one of my favorite net probs that uh, Mark and, and Rob Wittig led was called the One Star Reviews Net Prob, in which people would go to products on Amazon, wherever. It was a prompt that really got people to tell stories about these one star review items whether it was an item or anything that could be rated. And, oh, there were such beautiful rambling narratives. What we're doing is a kind of artistic graffiti on the web. And without all these digital networks, this just doesn't happen. It's really taking advantage of that potential of these spaces. And the wonderful thing is, just imagine 
you're out, you're looking for whatever it is product. And there's this one product, you know, you see how people have responded to this product and you get all the typical mundane stuff, some of which I'm sure is rather entertaining, right? Especially when you get to the one star review thing, but then you stumble upon this little bit of art, this little story, this, your day is perhaps transformed by it. And I think that's a really beautiful thing. Like people will find the banana slicer and it'll be like these hilarious reviews that people would just sort of collectively decide to do on these. We actually had this staged as a, a Reddit board that was an imaginary community that found value in things that other people had rated one star. Real or fictional was the other thing just to throw out there. Not all these were real items. So this is one realm of digital literature. Another realm that Leo also has plenty of experience in is the realm of generated literature that goes the other direction, like poetry generators. Just to give an example, you know, there's a wonderful poetry generator called Taroko Gorge, created by Nick Montfort, inspired by Taroko Gorge National Park. That's this beautiful piece of natural poetry, right? One of the oldest things we've ever written poetry about, but it produces poetry endlessly in little stanzas that are recognizable as poetry. And this little generator has been recreated by countless digital artists who have reskinned it to make it first Tokyo Garage, then Gorge, right? And they said they have a different theme each time. So maybe it's going to be cultural detritus. You know, maybe it's going to be food or maybe it's going to be Fred and George. There's a Harry Potter themed one, right? And they all have different variations. In some ways, they all continuously generate poetry. In other ways, they generate more generators. That's the creative act. Or some of Nick's generators in the hands of Lillian Yvonne Bertram take on the issues of police violence, take on the slogans of Black Lives Matter campaigns. Sometimes I think electronic literature can look like formalist experimentation gone crazy that wishes it had venture capital. But I think you find digital artists who are wrestling with the same social, political, emotional issues that all artists wrestle with. Turco Gorge really is kind of a little native e-poetic form. You know, the sonnet or the haiku or the villanelle, right? These are kind of poetic forms that have certain constraints. And when you take this engine that is very good at exploring rather obsessively what happens with recombining elements of a limited set of things. Let's say you're hiking through a canyon and you see flows and rocks and pools and trees and you hike for half an hour. What do you see? Rocks and falls and flows and and it's all the same limited number of elements. So it lends itself well to things like eating, endless consumption, or dating, or at a club, or sex in some of these cases. X number of body parts can combine in many interesting and, and provocative ways, right? And so on. It's a really neat kind of uh, exposition. It just shows what literary form might look like in the future. Literary artistry may be, for some people, the creation not of content, but of processes. And that's the big thing. So it's the soloit idea, but it's also the Olipo idea. And again, it's also the idea behind Neprov, because we create prompts, but it's creating processes and constraints that produce things that resonate with people. You're listening to Augmented Humanity. We'll be back in just a minute.
Welcome back to Augmented Humanity. Thank you both so much for coming here today. We've been talking a little bit about generative literature, and I want to pick up that thread a little bit because one of the things I started getting really puzzled about is authorship and readership and who's actually creating the literature. Say, if we're looking at adaptive works where you're making the choices or these generative works where the literature is sort of a vehicle that can be filled with different kinds of meaning. And I'm not sure how you all sort out these relationships. I'm Leo Flores. One of the things I really like about writing with machines about two years ago now, I gave a talk called Distant Writing. And the idea is it was a play on the concept of distant reading in the digital humanities, which is about using machines to read large text and doing these things. But we're used to writing very directly. Whether we use a pencil or a pen or a keyboard, we are selecting letters, putting words together in sequences in ways that are static but also generally deliberate. And here we are putting one word after another and then revising and the whole thing. That's kind of like a close writing. It's like a notion of control, control by the artist. Yeah, you have 100% control. But when you are writing generative literature, instead of using a pen or a keyboard, you are creating a machine a little software machine that is going to then write the kinds of output you intend. What you're doing is you're creating a field of possibilities with that little machine, with that little program. I'll give you an example from the very beginnings of electronic literature. As far as we know, the first work of electronic literature is Christopher Strachey's Love Letters, written 1952, on the Manchester One computer at Manchester University in England. This is one of the first computers, huge mainframe computers, that left the military after World War II, where they were used for code breaking by Alan Turing and other folks. And Christopher Strachey writes a love letter generator that whenever run would print out these short little love letters. Here's one, I'll read it real quick. Duck, duck, you are my little affection my beautiful appetite, my eager hunger, my covetous love lusts for your infatuation, my yearning anxiously clings to your fellow feeling, yours eagerly, M-U-C, or Manchester University Computer. You know, it's delightful, right? But every time you run it, it will generate. But it will generate within a field of possibilities. So you have an address, you have certain adjectives, nouns, modifiers that are coming in together, and these are intended. You can't say that the author is the computer program. It's a kind of a cyborg authorship. It's like a collaboration. Exactly. If the machine isn't producing the output you want, you modify the machine until it does. For instance, Darius Kazemi, the famous Twitter bot maker, he has written about ethics. If you create a machine that generates racist, sexist, or otherwise offensive content, and you have not done anything to correct that, then that's on you. You can't just blame the machine. That sticks to you as an author. So again, this is Mark Marino. And just to pick up right where Leo just left off, there's the famous case of the Microsoft chatbot named Tay that they made that was a little bit more AI-driven that learned to speak by having people speak with it. And of course, it learned the language of the internet. It learned hate. And so they had to pull that thing off the internet. So I love Leo's idea of the computer's a collaborator. The person doing the programming is a collaborator. Probably the person who built the machine's a collaborator on some level. And then the other person I just want to bring in is this notion of the reader and the interactor as one of the co-authors as well. And that's an idea that I was first introduced to by George Landau, who did a lot of theorizing on literary hypertext back in the day. And so when I think about some of these projects, art making projects, I think it's helpful to put them in terms of some of the other arts. So Rob Wittig and I, we collaborate at Meanwhile NetProv Studios to make these NetProvs, these online collaborative things. And we often talk about creating playgrounds for people. 
So a playground is nothing until the children arrive or the teens who show up sometimes a little too old for the playground, right? Or the grandparents show up to watch their grandkids. Or is it architects, right? Maybe architecture gives us a model. Or maybe cooking gives us the model of recipes passed down from generation to generation. Everybody puts their new spin on them. And then there's something that's going to happen in that moment with those ingredients. And then something else is going to happen when the people taste it, right? They're completing the recipe. Another art that has recently come into my realm are the intersections between coding and the fiber arts, which includes weaving and stitching and knitting. And so these are these pattern-based, process-based art forms that are passed down generation to generation, that are shared communally, and that sort of similar to cooking, you're following a little bit of a recipe, a pattern perhaps, and then you are executing it, I guess, in collaboration with your tools. And then again, maybe the knitted scarf is completed when it goes around the neck of your loved one, hopefully to comfort them, not to choke them. If we think about digital art forms that invite readers as participants, it might be, in the case of a poetry generator, the person just letting it run on their screen. There are these two uh, fine theorists up at UC Davis who love to let computer generated just run on their browser just as long as they can run. So it's like a bubbling fountain that you might have in your living room rather than here's this book of poetry. Or maybe it's interactive fiction. It's the good old fashioned go west, go east or VR, which is often the same thing where you're navigating through space. And again, that piece is not complete until the person comes in and starts moving through the space, observing what they observe, interacting, participating in story making. The writer that writes a hypertext fiction is yielding some of that control to the reader who will be drawn to make certain choices. Or not drawn. <laughs> or not drawn. You sometimes also yield control to the computer's ability to generate randomness. It depends on where you want to let go of some of that control. I've recently been doing some collaborating with a wonderful interactive fiction writer named Ryan Veter. And he'll say, well, we've got this juicy part. He's like, I'm going to put that behind some puzzles. And I said, why? I want people to see that. I don't want them to have to get through puzzles. He's like, I don't think you understand. In the world of interactive fiction... Really, it's like the reader's hero's journey, like their negotiation with the piece is the story, not just those little gems that you wrote that they're going to get, you know, if they navigate this in a certain way, but it's they're processing all of that. I was going to ask you guys about this because when I was a kid, I was really into the choose your own adventures. But if something bad happens, then you just go back to the page you just chose from and then you chose the other thing, right? And I found when I was looking at your piece, The Living Will, Mark, where you couldn't go back and change it. You had to start reading from the beginning. You actually saw the text morph and transform. And I got very upset. And that's when I realized that I was really much more deeply personally invested as a reader than I am when I'm reading just linear fiction. I wanted that hero's journey myself. I wanted to do it right. Which is a little bit of a trap in that piece, because for people who have not seen it, as you read the electronic living will of the main character as one of his heirs, you do accrue medical and legal fees the longer you read it. And then when you get to the inheritances, you can choose to steal from the other heirs if you wish. You know, as an English major, I came to learn this a long time ago that, you know, maybe I'm playing a different game than other people are playing success-wise or otherwise. Certainly you can't win that one necessarily. The losing is more interesting. Oh, I should put that on my tombstone. <laughs> I collaborate with my children on these digital stories about a magical foster care home. And they are choose-your-own-adventure stories about these foster kids. And it's inspired by my own family because we have an adoptive family. We're a forever family. And so we write from our experience. But I learned through the Electronic Literature Organization a great presentation by a guy named Lucas Prieto. There are a good portion of readers who, when they're going through those choose your own adventure stories, they feel a kind of anxiety that they're missing out on something. 
so now here I'm making these stories that are about foster care children, children who have very little agency. And the last thing I want to do is cause my readers anxiety. And so we've worked very hard in those stories. We don't have a back button, but we do have jetpacks that allow you to go back and remake choices. An interesting thing came out a few years ago that changed my relationship to digital literature. And there were these psychological studies that showed that, well, even though a lot of us were predicated on this notion of like infinite choice is better. I think all you have to do is walk into like a beauty store or anything like that to realize that is obviously not the case. You want to have a few choices and then those choices can become more meaningful. And then also maybe do a little bit of funneling so that you're not really ever going to miss out on things that are truly important. Because as it turns out, some things about storytelling, like having predictable endings are kind of important to building significance unless you want your story to be about multiplicities, which some people do, and but not everybody. Well, and it also brings up, I would argue, notions of trust between the artistic creator and the viewer or reader, which is people don't want to feel like you're just going to pull the rug out from under them. People don't like to be suckered. Yes. So for good or for bad, that suckering thing, I go where angels fear to tread, which is so sometimes with our net props, we do them in public in a way that can be unpredictable. And just two net prop projects I just want to mention very, very quickly. One, we've done through the social media accounts of reality TV celebrity Spencer Pratt involving his followers, where his followers didn't necessarily know we were running the account, but maybe people who are a little more sensitive readers would wonder why an obscure British poet would be tweeting through this account. Maybe more unpredictable was when we did run the fictional Occupy group, Occupy MLA, that was protesting the Modern Language Association. It was a little more War of the Worlds than we would hope and did lead to the Modern Language Association increasing their security at their conference to prevent us from occupying them and protesting for adjuncts' rights. At the same time, coincidentally, I guess, the Modern Language Association began to promote its own efforts in the name of adjuncts' rights in teaching. So I'm not saying Occupy MLA was part of that, but I'm saying there was a huge amount of uncertainty, unpredictability of how that was going to play out, even from experienced NEPROF creators. And we had participants who were unfortunately, maybe unwittingly, stumbling into an art piece the way you might stumble into a happening or something like that, for good or for ill. And I would add, it was interesting to see, and I'm not in any way trolling anyone here, this is the MLA, right? You have these highly sophisticated scholars of literature and languages and all these things who are so used to being really savvy and critical about works, but they were just like any other person, emoting and reacting and critiquing what happened in very naive ways. They couldn't get out of themselves onto their critical minds and kind of look at the thing. Or maybe they did, but from the starting point of, oh, I felt betrayed because I thought this was real and it wasn't, or whatever. It was interesting to watch from the outside as it unfolded. Here's the thing to throw out there, and again, I'm the last person to necessarily argue for the ethics or not of that particular piece. But I will say that from my point of view, you know, these platforms have been around for the blink of an eye. Facebook, Meta, has convinced us that we need to verify authenticity of people. And that's largely so that they can authentically take and sell our data to other people, right? So some of us remember when the internet was a place of more uncertainty where you weren't sure who was behind any particular message at any given time. And then there are others of us who see that as as an invitation for creativity and creative play. I definitely get comments, obviously, from my great aunt who will say, I don't quite understand what's happening on your Facebook account. But at the same time, part of the spirit that I take to digital literature is inviting people to say, hey, all of these new platforms that are arriving, what if we did something literary together on them instead of playing them at their terms and pretending that they have to be transparent windows into our realities? The first person to use the filter on their Instagram picture should be well aware authenticity is a fabrication that's pretty valueless. This isn't real. This is performance art. And I'm going to treat it like performance art. 
it's not reality and it's not physical space. And I'm telling a story here and it's a story. It's not a documentary. We're both nodding furiously. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Agreed. Agreed. You're listening to Augmented Humanity. We'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back to Augmented Humanity. Mark, Leo, thank you so much for being with us today. Before we get into some of the nitty gritty of how you all work towards creating electronic literature, fostering electronic literature, some of the tools and techniques, I'd like to sort of just ask you both a personal question, which is how did you both get to be where you are now? being maybe evangelists for electronic literature and fostering electronic literature. What was the path that brought you to doing this work now at this time in this place? You're asking for my origin story, like I'm a superhero. Well, you know, as a kid growing up in Puerto Rico in the 80s, I was a teenager. I learned to program on the Apple IIe computer at school. I would write little programs in BASIC and make a word jump across the screen and do all kinds of random generation with that. I didn't know I was creating electronic literature at the time. I didn't have a concept of it. I was studying English in an English department when I went to college in the late 80s, very early 90s. And I studied literature. I fell in love with comics along the way. I was really interested in the multimodality image and text kind of working together, and went on to go do a master's degree at Bowling Green State University in English, but I wrote my master's thesis on Neil Gaiman's comics. In the 90s, I did a lot of research on comics, but also fell in love with film as a medium, because here you have image, voice, sound, camera, right? And it's a time-based medium. And so when I went to go do my PhD, I went to University of Maryland, and I was really interested in studying with a professor that was famous for his work on Stanley Kubrick. When I got there, the professor was not there. He had been recruited and gone off to California. Then I enrolled in a course uh, with Neil Freistadt where I first saw electronic literature, and it all clicked. My programming my fascination with multimodality, my fascination with time-based media, and I just fell in love with the thing, and I just decided to delve in and go deep. What really got me to evangelizing was in 2011, I found out I had been awarded a Fulbright to go to University of Bergen to teach and do research on electronic literature. And so I had this inspiration that I would read one e-poem per day and I would write something short and publish it in a blog every day. And I started a daily blogging project called I Love ePoetry. You can still find it out there under iloveepoetry.org. And I did it for 500 days in a row, not missing a day. I immersed myself, I built an audience I later invited other collaborators. That really got me going in terms of evangelizing and sharing electronic literature. In doing those kind of short entries that became this encyclopedic resource, I really kind of uh, made a voice for myself and it has led to many great things. And Mark, what about you? So what's your origin story? 
to use Leo's phrase. So I was bit by a radioactive bug of electronic literature, I guess. When, <laughs> when I was growing up, I'm, I'm similar in age. I'm younger than Leo, but I'm similar in age to Leo. I had also an early home computer, and I played a lot of interactive fiction games made by Infocom. Also, when my brother and I, I have an older brother, and we would do little experiments and basic, like, put the lyrics to Elvis songs to display in time with the recording as it played... I spent far too long doing things like that. And when I went to college, there actually almost was a major in electronic literature. I, I went to Brown University, and there's a fellow there named George Landau who was teaching a course in hypertext theory, which showed how literary hypertext was, in his mind, the embodiment of a lot of post-structuralist theory. So all the things about text being decentered, or the works of Roland Barthes. David Foster Wallace. <laughs> yeah, right, right. And also there was this postmodernist who's still alive named Robert Coover, who was teaching classes in hypertext writing. I didn't take that class. I took the theory class. I was kind of jealous of the theory class. They had this thing called the hypertext hotel where everybody would write different rooms of the hotel and characters would move from room to room. I mean, these things would later come to inspire the work that I would do in NetProv. And he had this conference called Unspeakable Acts on Natural Practices, where Kathy Acker was there, among other people. It was just like a phenomenal event that just blew my mind with everything that was going on there. So I got an MFA in fiction writing at Notre Dame, and I remember saying, hey, can I do hypertext here? And everyone just shook their heads and shrugged a little bit, and they taught me how to write fiction, of course. And I came out to Los Angeles in the late 90s, and I started this humor magazine with some friends of mine who I'd been in sketch comedy troops about. And I guess I should say that I think in addition to my literary training, my theatrical training and improv were always a big part of what caused me to want to you know, enter into this particular collaborative creative medium. So we started this online magazine called Bunk Magazine, where our goal was to create experiments and humor that we had never seen the likes of before that would be interactive in all of these ways. And satirical, and, you know, parodies, things like that. But in any case, I found myself in grad school once more. I met this amazing person, took a class with N. Catherine Hales and a guy named Bill Seaman, and they opened my mind to the current world of digital literature. There I met my later collaborators, Jessica Pressman and Jeremy Douglas. Jeremy and I would form a blog called Writer Response Theory. So similar to Leo, we wanted to learn about things, so we sort of blogged our way into it when blogging was more of a thing. Found myself in grad school at UC Riverside, where I ended up focusing on chatbots for my dissertation. Along the way, in about 2002, I went to my first ELO conference, which was state-of-the-art held at UCLA, and saw some, again, more works, including a presentation by my now writing partner, Rob Wittig. And then similar to Leo, it wouldn't be until 2011 when I would end up as a Fulbright specialist in Bergen, where I would bump into Rob Wittig again, that we started dreaming up NetProv together or realizing we had been dreaming up NetProv for a long time. It was years earlier that I continued to go to the Electronic Literature Organization events. So a combination of just my explosive love for everything that I had encountered through that organization and the fact that my parents are both public relations professionals led to my evangelizing to this date. Since 2008, I've been the director of communications for the organization. And if you haven't heard of it yet, if your listeners haven't heard of it yet, I take that as a personal failure. So I'm trying to correct that one podcast at a time. And that's the Electronic Literature Organization, ELO. We've heard the term now and the name a few times in our earlier segments, NetProv. What's NetProv? Well, we like to change the definition pretty much every time we say it, but we'll say that it's networked collaborative online writing. And that might take the form of collaborative writing games analogous to role-playing games or more like parlor games or poetry games Quick example, One Week No Tech, a fictional imaginary digital detox where we had people imagine giving up social media and digital technology for a week and tweeting about every moment of it. Insp <laughs> in 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 inspired by people's tendencies to go off into nature and see beautiful vistas and to finally be away from everyone and to say, I'm finally alone, and then to snap that picture and share it on social media. 
Would you all just tell us a little bit about the work of the Electronic Literature Association? Is it just in the U.S.? I mean, you both talked about going to Bergen. This organization started in the U.S. in the very late 20th century, but it immediately found like-minded partners and members all over France, England, Spain, different parts of Latin America, and it has been growing and growing and growing. It's a registered nonprofit in the United States. The main mission of the organization is to promote and nurture the study and creation of electronic literature. We have developed a number of activities over the years to help do that. For instance, we have white papers on preservation and archiving. We have built an amazing archive and museum called The Next, and that is an amazing space that you all need to visit. The work itself is preserved in our servers, sometimes video and photo documentation, that kind of thing. And then this is shared open access to the world. So in addition to what Leo mentioned, we have the Electronic Literature Directory, which is another resource that is analogous to what Leo was describing he was doing on iHeart ePoetry. We have the Cell Project, which is, uh, let's say, a mothership of directories that are all building knowledge bases of work in electronic literature. And, of course, we have our annual conference, which for the past two years has been all online, but very possibly this coming May will happen online and at Como Italy. And of course, all those endeavors meant to preserve, circulate, promote the community, the artists, the criticism of electronic literature. The promoting it and talking about the current state of the art is one thing, but I hadn't even thought about preservation. 25 years ago, if you wrote a book, then there was a book on acid-free paper. And most likely I could pull that book off the shelf in 100 years and read the same words. But with the electronic stuff, it's like you guys were talking about. Some of my favorite artistic works of the late 20th century were appearing online in technologies that don't run anymore. Like, how do I pull that off the shelf and revisit that artwork? You need to talk to Dini Gregar and her team. They're doing amazing work in preservation. She is leading the field, really, with the project, The Next. So I really invite you to check it out. So that's the irony, right? You have these artists working in this bleeding edge technology, right? The state of the art, the latest of the latest. And of course, you know, a year from now, people may not be able to access that very same thing. ELO has developed some best practices. There's a wonderful document called Acid Free Bits, which gives some guidelines to artists on how to create using open source tools, open access and then maybe relying a little bit more on code and less on software where possible, right? That's kind of the trap many of us fell into with Flash. And if we can get people writing in JavaScript and HTML5, whatever, there might be some longevity. You know, when you're creating art on other people's corporate platforms, right? So Rob and I do a lot of our work on Twitter, and then Twitter changes its algorithm. We write something on Facebook, and then Facebook changes its algorithm. Suddenly those things become inaccessible. Although, I'm okay with that hazard. There's a part of me that wants to see everything preserved, and another part that realizes that I'm making Zen gardens, and that's okay with me. If somebody hearing this says, this is so cool, and I totally want to check out the conference, or participate in a net prof, or read more, where would you point people? Or what would you recommend as a good entry-level activity? One of my favorites is using this resource called Cheap Bots Done Quick. V. Buckingham in England, they created this resource. And what it does, all you need is a Twitter account. You connect it to Cheap Bots Done Quick. It's free. And you create the script. Super simple. It has the ability to create some parameters. And boop, you can launch your bot. And I use that to create all kinds of bots. One of my favorite practitioners of that is Nora Reed, who has created bots like Endless Scream. Every 10 minutes, it screams on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> right? 
but also has one called Think Piece Bot that generates the headlines of think pieces published in, you know, New York Times or whatever. There are just so many wonderful things. One of my recent bots is the Taco Hell Menu Bot. It's a parody of Taco Bell, the most combinatorial of fast food joints. They'll mix anything with anything to create a new product. And so every couple of hours, it generates a new menu item and a pitch for it. You know, like the Cheetos Carnitas Taco. I love it. I love it. You know, I think Twine is a very accessible tool. Something you can use the online version if you'd like, just a little Googling around. For someone who is totally ignorant, Twine is... Twine is a storytelling tool for making hypertext, so making things connected by links, very simple web pages. That's a tool that people can usually pick up without much difficulty. You know, then maybe a little bit more might be trying your hand at a Taroko Gorge. That's not all that difficult. Check out the Meanwhile NetProv Studio because about three times a year we run a NetProv that usually requires just maybe like a Twitter account or whatever platform we're using. Those are open to anyone to participate in. You know, if you want to go beyond Twine, I'm very fond of one called Ink, which is another scripting language for writing interactive fiction. I-N-K or I-N-C? I-N-K, Ink, yes. I would say it is possible that there are more tools at people's disposal than they might think. Obviously, from the NetProv standpoint, you can create digital literature in your Excel spreadsheet if you wish. But back in the bunk days, I did keep a little Confederacy of Dunces inspired piece called Journal of a Working Boy. And it was a little diary written in an Excel spreadsheet. He was my version of Ignatius. And he would just complain about his colleagues in the digital era. I hate to say it, it is possible when you're sending GIFs in your text messages, you play around with some emojis, you're already engaging in this mode. And this is just maybe extending it out a little bit further. Go out and check the electronic literature collections and you can see what people can do when they have a little bit more time, perhaps. The people are welcome to join the organization, of course. They can join our Facebook group, follow us on Twitter, Instagram. I don't think we have a TikTok just yet. But also we host events as well. We host a new event called First Fridays that operate out of our Discord and members are invited to those. We often have book launches and things like that as well at those. And then we have Second Tuesday Salons that we don't sponsor, but that we promote by Dina Larson. We're here for anyone who's interested at whatever level. And if nothing else, I hope people would hear this series of conversations as an invitation as a provocation and hopefully some inspiration to do some digital making or some digital reading. I'll add people are already doing this. That's part of the idea of the third generation of electronic literature. People, when they use Instagram or use TikTok, right, they take a little video, they take an image, and then they start writing on it. They're not writing on the page. They're writing on images. They're writing on video. They're putting text that isn't behaving the way text behaves on the page. It dances around. It glitters. It does other things. Almost all those platforms still call them stories. Yeah, yeah. Stories are real. Right, right. But these are things that I'm pretty sure we would have recognized as video art a few decades ago, right? We would have called this like visual poetry or something like that back in the day. And then also realizing that even though there are conventions to using even those platforms, again, they've only existed for the blink of an eye, just do something else with them and you're already going to be pushing things in an interesting direction. How could there be rules to what an Instagram post needs to be at this point? I don't understand that. Who's enforcing that? Who's the Emily Post of Instagram? I don't understand. And even basic tools... PowerPoint. Use PowerPoint as a writing tool to create animations. Like Tan Lin creates sophisticated animations using PowerPoint and then letting it run with, I don't know, 30, 40 frames per second. Each slide is a frame and now it's being used as a cinematic composition. I have a micro novel that I publish one sentence at a time in my email signature. So tell me which part of the medium we're not allowed to use to write in and I'm going to write in it. Leo, Mark, thank you so much for being with us today to talk about the Electronic Literature Organization and both of your work in this relatively new medium and paradigm. We really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us today. Thank you so much for having us. It's been a pleasure. Yes, absolutely. It's a privilege to be here. Thank you so much. 
And if you would like more information about our guest's work, you can visit their organization. That's eliterature.org. Augmented Humanity is a program of the New Mexico Humanities Council produced in partnership with KUNM-FM. You can visit us online and find out more about our programs at nmhumanities.org. Our theme music comes courtesy James Whiten, and we've had production assistance from Tristan Klum. So I spend my waking life just driving around in circles, up and down, up and down the same old city streets. I never dreamed that I would become a bus driver, but I got myself a stereo system, bought it over in Mercer Island, and boy, let me tell you, that motherfucker sounds sweet. That motherfucker sounds sweet. So you can find me just sitting at my crossroads, waiting for the light to change. And the same familiar faces come onto my bus and remind me that I'm in my range. Sonambulance, sonambulance, sonambulance. They're filing past, but their spirit never dies. Something goes unspoken, just resigned to their lives. Something goes unspoken, something we forgot about a long time ago. Something got lost along the way. We just all became resigned to our lives. So I'm standing on the corner of the street and the street and the sun is beating down. I gotta get on the bus, get on the bus, I gotta get downtown. Well, last night was a party, last night was a time I had a bit too much and I got out of line and now I'm standing like a bat in the sunshine. And if that bus don't show up soon, I think that I might go blind. If that bus don't show up soon, I think I might go blind. Where is that confounded bus? Hey, wait a minute. Is that the number 17? Oh, no, it's the number 36 again. What's up with that? Where is that confounded bus? Where's that bus? Ah, oh, here it comes. Pull up, get up, step up, step in, say, hey, Jimmy, doing all right? Gotta get my money to the token man, man, because we were his token all last night. So I gotta get my money to the token man, was token all last night. The bus driver's getting high with me, and I'm getting high with the bus driver. The bus driver's getting high with me, and I'm getting high with the bus driver. The bus driver's getting high with me. And by the miracle of public transportation, I find myself in another location. But the bus stops running at 10 o'clock, so what am I supposed to do now? Do I have to call you just to get home? Do I have to climb down from my throne, get down on my hands and knees so that I can beg for your forgiveness? Well, it's a full-time occupation under my own business. It's a full-time occupation under my own business. It's a full-time occupation under my own business.